Hello, everybody. Um, so it's an honor to be invited here. It's my first time at the VIEW conference, and it's been a really fun and interesting conference. Um, so as John said, my name is Jommer van Beek, and I'm the studio art director at Guerrilla Games. Uh, Guerrilla Games is part of Sony's worldwide studio system, and that's about 10 developers, including developers like Polyphony and Naughty Dog and Santa Monica Studios. Um, and we're Guerrilla, we're in Amsterdam, we're a small part of that. We have about 250 developers. And for those who know, basically our latest title was Horizon Zero Dawn, which is an open world action role playing game. Um, that's a whole bunch of words. It basically means an adventure game. Um, so just to get an idea, who of you knows Horizon or has played Horizon? Okay, that's a good number. Thank, thank you all for playing it. Um, so for the ones that haven't seen it, um, or that maybe come from completely different industries like animation and don't really play that much games, we're going to start with a reminder. This is our E3 trailer from 2015, so this was the first time we showed anything of our game. We weren't the first ones here. Our stories speak of the ones that came before. The old ones. The world of the old ones was so different than ours. They had built incredible cities with towers that reached the stars. But a darkness came, and their cities turned to graves. And without them, the land started to change. Their great cities faded away. And in their place came new life. Over time, one by one, the tribes came to these lands. Some small and humble, some powerful as kings. They say my tribe was the first. The first to hunt. The first to raise our bows. For this world was never ours. We've always shared a dangerous balance between man and machine. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about the art design of Horizon, uh, but before we go there I want to talk about the idea behind Horizon. So we get a lot of questions about the origins of the idea. Uh, so where does an idea about a young girl hunting robot dinosaurs in a post-apocalyptic world come from? Um, so it all started in 2010, seven years ago, when our studio asked us, all the development staff, everybody in the studio, to pitch ideas for a new game. And before that time, we had worked on Killzone for a decade. And Killzone, for those who know it, that's a first-person shooter set in a dark and dystopian world where you shoot space Nazis. Um, and while Killzone had been moderately successful, it was never really a great hit. So after six titles, we needed to ask the question, is this really the best way of spending all this time, all this talent, and all this effort? Is this really the type of games that we want to continue making? Now, in game development, you have something that's called franchise fatigue. Uh, games aren't really like movies. Uh, movies, it's very common that a completely different team makes the sequel to a movie. But making a sequel to a video game is like making a sequel to a movie while also at the same time making a whole new version of Maya. 
Um, there's millions and millions of pieces of code, lines of code speaking in an entertainment piece, piece like this. And it's not something that you can really easily hand over to another team and also then expect improved results. So the usual case is that the same team works on SQL after SQL after SQL after SQL for more than a decade. And at some point, people get really tired of that. So also, how many different games can you really make about shooting space Nazis with red glowing eyes? So Sony has quite a unique process. It's, it's very fundamentally bottom-up. Uh, Sony doesn't really tell the studios what sort of games they should make. Uh, they don't even strategize to that level. They let us figure that out. Uh, and in Gorilla case, we take that one step further. We go to our own developers and we ask them, what are the sort of games maybe that we would like to make, that you would like to make? Uh, and before you try this at home, it's probably good to understand that giving this amount of greater freedom to your developers also needs a lot of guidance. You don't just basically let them run with that. Uh, so we put together this really, really big brief. Uh, and the, the headline of the brief was, develop an epic, cinematic, character-driven game franchise with intense action-packed gameplay, strong storytelling, set in a distinct and rich future. So uh, yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> now. This sounds big, but it's actually pretty open. It mostly says, don't come up with a mobile puzzle game. And because we had all this creative, uh, creative autonomy, we also felt as a team that we had a lot of responsibility to do this really right. Not just creatively, but also think about the strategy and the commercial aspects of it. So we put together a nine page brief to our staff that included, included a large range of topics. Um, so first of all, Guerrero's goals and ambitions for this. We wanted to make a high production value blockbuster game with a 90 Metacritic and 3 million units of sales in the first year. Uh, thankfully, making those 3 million of units came after the first week. Uh, we were very happy with the results in that regard. Also, no genre was really excluded, so you could come up with any type of game. But certain things need to be considered. Uh, Sony had certain areas where they didn't really have games. So Sony wasn't really making RPGs or action RPGs. And of course, basically, we wanted to learn from our past experiences. So we were quite good at making combat games. And we felt like, well, we should probably keep making combat games and not start making racing games, for example. Um, all these sort of aspects of what the studio was strong in and what we wanted to do and where we wanted to go were sort of taken into the brief. And people started to come up with pitches for it. And we asked them to think big. Uh, basically, the whole ambition behind the project and the concept was to come up with something basically that could not just be one game, but could be a series of games, books, movies, and all the stuff that comes out of it. Really start thinking sort of Star Wars big. So, sorry about that. Uh, received uh, about 30 to 40 pitches, and this is just a small part of it. Uh, and although we didn't really specifically ask them, don't do something like Killzone, it sort of naturally came out of the process. Basically, almost every concept that was pitched was very, very different from Killzone. Um, but there were many recurring themes and notes that we saw in the pitches. Uh, certain themes and aspects clearly gravitated with us. Um, so for one, uh, we were clearly done with dystopian worlds of glass and steel and concrete. Uh, a lot of people wanted to make something that was lush and rich and colorful. Uh, and thankfully, we weren't really done with robots and mechs. Uh, we are all little sci-fi nerds in that regard, and we still wanted to build really cool machines. But what we really wanted was to create something that was different and unique and positive and fresh. Uh, something that would be very eye-catching and evocative, and something that would really stand out among all the other games in the market. Now, Hor Horizon clearly stood out from all the different concepts that were pitched. It was by far the favorite pitch among all the staff, as well as all the colleagues that we have at our studios. And so what was it really that drew people towards this concept? Now, uh, to some degree, we're still trying to figure that out. Sometimes it's easier to be successful than to know why you're successful. Um, but we have some ideas, Beggy, why this clicked. And first of all, Beggy, it had a lot of very contrasting themes, very contrasting elements. There were lots of intra interesting juxtapositions that created intrigue and tension within the concept. So, for example, it's a world where the flow of time almost seems to have reversed. The, the primitive is following the technologically advanced. And it's the world where the world of science has become the world of myth and magic. It sort of switches things around about what is magic and what is science. Um, and it's a world, a world that questions the definition of life as we know it. It's a world where the artificial has become the natural. 
Now usually, um, when you go for a really high concept sci-fi, it's quite a hard sell. Uh, but we got lucky, uh, Avatar had come out a couple of years before, and that had clearly shown maybe that audiences are still interested in science fiction, as long as you do something interesting and new with it. Uh, and as you may know, probably you've seen Avatar, uh, it's a back to nature story. It's a back to nature story about a spacefaring civilization that clashes with a tribal inhabitants of this really pretty world. Uh, that world is really a celebration of everything that's magical about nature. And this movie also asked some important questions. It asked the question whether technology and nature are opposite forcing, natural opposite forces of each other. Now, other things were happening in the years before Avatar, uh, probably also because of the rise of technology. There was this resurgence of appreciation for the natural world. Uh, you probably all remember Planet Earth and all the beautiful nature documentaries. And ironically, this was actually sort of, this was made possible by new technology, uh, new technology and filming technologies that allowed the BBC to show nature in a whole new way. Uh, to some degree, basically, we were using technology to highlight what's so special about nature. Um, but of course, at the same time, uh, Al Gore started war warning us uh, that something might be wrong. And we all became aware about the flip side of technology as well, that the notion developed that if we provoke nature to heart, it might turn on us and create sort of like a new apocalyptic scenario, a new end of the world scenario. Now there are, have always been apocalyptic scenarios uh, for as long as I can remember. Maybe probably one of the most famous ones is the alien invasion. Maybe we had War of the Worlds already in I think 1890. And then of course we have nuclear war and we have the, the zombie war. Uh, all kinds of ways of the world could end. And sometimes also new ones come, come into fashion based on societal fears. So now we have global environmental collapse, for example, in movies like 2012 and other ones. And we have the rise of the machines, of course, and in some cases even smart monkeys that are taking over the world. Also a new type of apocalypse that we're all worried about. Now in any case, uh, a lot of these apocalyptic stories are quite different. Uh, there's a lot, and they really focus about the events of the apocalypse, about what happens before it, what happens during it. And then you get to the post-apocalypse, and then suddenly everything becomes very, very samey. Uh, we see quite a loss of conceptual variety. They tend to be dark, decrepit worlds, filled with constant danger, and most commonly the danger is actually other people that are trying to survive. Uh, it's, it's a very harsh world. It's not necessarily a pleasant viewing experience, if anybody's ever seen The Road, for example. Now, the end of the world has fascinated storytellers and audience for a very long time, uh, but as I said, the worlds that we've been depicting are sort of these sort of worlds. They've become overly familiar to our audiences. And what Horizon promised to do is provide a new and different view of the apocalypse. Uh, so the common notion is that the end of mankind will also medically be the end of the world. And of course, that's not really the case, because sort of life on Earth has ended almost completely already six times over, I think, and every single time life has a tendency to come back. Life finds a way, as the doctor in Jurassic Park would say it. And this is what Hor Horizon promised, a sort of escape from the dreariness of the post-apocalyptic scenarios that we've seen to something that we started calling the post-post-apocalyptic apocalypse. I'm sure somebody will come up with a post-post-post-apocalypse as well. Um, so this is not necessarily a new world, but, and it's also not necessarily dystopian or the utopian. Uh, it's more one that has sort of blossomed on what you would say the ashes of our own world. And this is a world that isn't concerned anymore with the past. Uh, the apocalypse has something that's very long ago. It's, it's the stuff of mythology now. All the dark days are over and life, as you can see, it has sort of moved on. So it's a, it's a sort of happy view of the apocalypse. Uh, and one that doesn't really, is sort of like a morbid display of death, but it's much more a celebration of life in its all its variety. It's a much brighter world. Um, now in fiction, there aren't really many stories that sort of explore the world that comes after. Uh, there's probably some more, but these are the ones that I know about. Uh, Nausicaa is sort of, in, although it, it's hidden, it's a post apocalyptic world, and of course Planet of the Apes is sort of a very interesting world where suddenly the monkeys are in charge. Um, now creatively, having very little of the words helps uh, because the audience doesn't really ex have much expectations about these worlds. You have a lot of freedom. You, it allows you to be very bold and surprise and intrigue the audience with something that's new and unfamiliar. Um, but the stories that do exist about the post-post-apocalypse, uh, they add something really interesting to the, to the mix, and that's mystery. There's usually a sort of detective story going on. 
uh, there's a question about what happened before and maybe how is that important to this world. And these questions are often intellectually, for an audience, quite compelling. Uh, it's something that they can explore, it's something unknown, it's something mysterious, and it makes a world like this a proper adventure. But it's also much harder to make it believable. Um, it can intrigue the audience, but if it doesn't make sense, like well-built dinosaurs don't necessarily make sense, you're not going to keep them engaged in your fantasy for very long. So the ultimate magic trick of production design is to create a world that both has a sense of authenticity as well as believability. One second. And now, in our design process, we generally avoid just rushing towards the end visual. Uh, we're not big fans of just Peggy throwing the key art out there and then Peggy start making that. What we tend to do is just layer things very, very slowly, research almost every single element of the world before we even start thinking about how it would come all together. So, a key inspiration in, in this process was Ellen Weissman's book, The World Without Us. Um, I don't know if any of you have read it, it's a really interesting book. In this book, he describes a scenario where all humans on Earth suddenly disappear, like that, they're all gone. And he doesn't really explain why, because it's not that important. Uh, the point of the book is that he describes the processes that slowly, slowly, over centuries and millennia, will sort of erase all traces of humanity. Everything, basically, that slowly disappears. So, of course, mountains crumble, buildings crumble. Uh, at some point, basically, the Ice Age will come back and literally scrape all of New York off the map. Uh, and at some point, basically, of course, the sun will blow up and take everything away. And he describes this very, very nicely. Actually, what's nice about it is that he describes the last thing of humanity that will remain, which is the Voyager probe, because by the time that the sun explodes, this thing will be 2.6 million light years further down the road. So the last thing of humanity is that probe with the golden plate of humanity on it. Um, and so we started to recreate that process. We took a typical mid-Western American town uh, and started to visualize what would happen over time. So in Horizon's background story, the apocalypse destroyed all biomatter. So every single living cell basically was destroyed. And that basically means that we have a completely lifeless desert. Even the soil, basically that all turns to sand at that point. And so we studied what, studied what would, ha would happen with buildings in these type of desert environments. Uh, and it's very easy that you see some typical patterns. Of course, roofs collapse. If you've ever seen a ruin, basically they usually don't have roofs. At some point, the walls fall down, and what remains standing are the facades, the arches, the columns, the, the famous ruins that we sometimes see in the desert. And strangely, chimneys. Chimneys are literally indestructible. They will stand forever and ever, ever. They can withstand earthquakes, everything. So at some point, very far beyond as mankind has died, we still see shit chimneys everywhere. Um, and then also, basically, if you're thinking about the ground, the earth itself, you have the soil and all the fibers. If you take all of that away, basically it just becomes sand. And sand over time starts moving like a liquid. So it will flow around the buildings and over the buildings. And just like the dunes in the Sahara, basically you get just this, this fluid simulation basically moving around the ruins. Uh, and of course that shifting sands basically affects the ruins. It might push them over, it might bury them. But also the ruins sort of start changing the landscape because science will pile on top of it and get stuck behind nooks and crannies. So the, the ruins sort of basically become the new stones of this, this, of this world. And then at some point life returns. Uh, and it will first of course spring up in places where the soil can still hold water. So if you think about it, you'll have walls, basically, and between the walls and the sand, there's a little bit of water, and then plants start to happen there. And then slowly, life grows back, uh, but in a completely almost unrecognizable place from what it was. There are no streets anymore. All of that basically will be gone. And so what you end up with is something that is both buried as well as overgrown at the same time. And then we'll take that further, basically hundreds of years further. At some point, skyscrapers will start crumbling and they will become hills. They'll literally get that shape. And then, of course, basically as you get new hills, rivers will start to change course and they will cut canyons through these new hills. So you get a landscape where you can still see sort of like the bones of old cities. Uh, the following movie that I'm going to show is the first art benchmark that we had. So this is from... 2014, it's about a year into production and still two and a half years ago, so this is quite rough uh, in compared to the finished product, uh, but I'll show it to you. It's, it sort of basically shows what we were wanting to do with nature and with the ruins.
The final combined result of all these elements is one of Horizon's three, one of Horizon's three conceptual pillars. Um, so I'll explain the concept of conceptual pillars because it's quite important to our process. Um, at Guerrilla we use a game design process, a methodology that's called the pillar methodology. Uh, and within this process basically you have a couple of game pillars and these are key statements about what the intended experience is. So it takes an enormous amount of time and efforts to craft these pillars, uh, as the wording needs to be extremely precise. Ex exactly every word needs to be there for a reason. Uh, and so one of the pillars is about Horizon uh, and maybe the wilderness and the overgrown ruins. The other two are about the tribal cultures and the machines. And actually, to some degree, Aloy, the main character, is of course also an implicit pillar. But I'll focus on the two other key pillars that we have in the game. Um, the first one is about the tribes, uh, and this is maybe literally the pillar that we used while developing it. Uh, it's quite a mouthful, uh, but a key observation maybe is that it speaks in plural pluralities, in multitudes. It's about cultures, stories, characters. It became very clear maybe that this is a game about volume. Uh, as production designers, it wasn't just our job to come up with a rich tribal culture, but a whole range of them, and a whole world of them. Uh, and also, the pillar doesn't just have a subtext about volume, it also implies diversity, distinction and believable, believability, because these are all elements that you need if you want to create something that's memorable. Now, especially the part about believability can be very challenging. Uh, and for this, basically, we use a production design process that's called intrinsic ideation. Uh, so, maybe some of you have heard of the rule of cool. Uh, the rule of cool states that things will always be cooler if you just keep adding cool stuff to it. Uh, the problem, of course, is that it completely destroys any sense of believability in an idea as you keep adding mismatched elements to it. Uh, and, of course, I see you guys think already, aren't you the guys that added robot dinosaurs to a game? So, yeah, uh, I'll come to that later. Uh, so, intrinsic ideation is a process that doesn't allow you to do it. It doesn't just allow you to add cool stuff to everything. Everything that you, have, that you design has to be there for a reason. Everything that needs to look a certain way because there is a reason behind it. So everything basically gets very, very carefully thought out. And so before we started designing our tribal cultures, our first question was, how does culture develop in the real world? Uh, and we studied a lot of theories, we talked to a lot of anthropologists, and surely they don't agree on everything, but one of the things that they commonly all agree in is that culture is all about the resources that are available in environments. Uh, it's dependent where a culture sort of takes root to see basically how it develops. Um, so let me give an illustration of that. And we'll start by with one of our tribes, which is called the Nora. Uh, and this is a tribe that lives in the Rocky Mountains. And what does that mean? Well, if you're living in the, in the mountains in general, basically, there isn't a lot of farmable land. So agriculture is quite hard. So that basically means that you're usually dependent on hunting and fishing for your food. Uh, and basically that basically means you're, you have a hunter-gathering lifestyle. And without ag agriculture, there's also a limit on how large a tribe can, go, can become. You don't have grain silos, and if you ever play civilization, you know this, you need the, the grain silos to make big cities. Uh, so oh, so uh, hunter-gathering tribes tend to be a lot smaller. Uh, and it also means basically that everybody in a tribe has to pretty much do everything. If you aren't really big, you can't specialize. So you don't have tailors or carpenters or tradesmen or even soldiers. Um, then another thing, Becky, if you have high mountain passes, Becky, it's quite hard to get out of it or get into it. So trade is a lot harder as well. So what you can expect from these people is they tend to be quite self-reliant and probably a little bit weary of strangers. If you think about it, a little bit like the Swiss. <laughs> Now also, in the background story, uh, and also based on game design decisions, it was stated that there were no large animals in the world anymore. So there weren't any cows, there were any horses, no deers, bears, or, or mountain lions. And so our art designers basically had to take all of these elements, all of these ideas and concepts, and all of these limitations, and start thinking about something very simple. Clothing. How do you make clothing if you don't have large heights, uh, and basically if you don't have agriculture? Uh, so what you see, and basically we sort of studied this because there are tribes in the real world basically that live like this, all the little pelts are quite small, you're hunting rabbits, so basically your clothing is going to be a patchwork, and if you don't have advanced tailors or leather working, it's going to look quite coarse as well. So all these sort of elements start to inspire basically what the tribe needs to look like, like not what it can look like. 
Um, we also sort of started thinking like, okay, cotton is probably not an option because how do you grow cotton in the mountains? But the Rocky Mountains are known for their wild mountain goats, so wool might still be an option. And so even though you might not have weaving equipment because that's quite advanced, it's still possible to braid and knit and put things together. So we started thinking, Beggy, that actually, Beggy, now that we're thinking about it, rope is probably quite important for these people because they're hunters and you need rope for pretty much everything. You need it for traps, you need it for bows, you need it for fishnets. So Beggy, this will probably actually be a culture where rope is, is, is a really important element. And if that's the case, then probably it also is a big element in their construction. So it's likely that maybe they will use the rope to put beams together and wood together and start building larger structures. And so now this starts informing maybe their architecture. So what do you do if you have lots of trees and you have rope? Well, you start building huts maybe that are built out of trees and ropes. Um, so this is sort of basically how we layer our entire design decision process, constantly building on the foundations that we established as sort of intrinsic truths in the, in the society that we're building. So everything is there for a reason. Now as this process of ideation continues, the outlines of a culture start to shake, sh take shape. But the problem is that in this case, basically, it starts looking quite mundane. Uh, this could just as easily fit into any sort of, you know, Lord of the Rings world or Game of Thrones world. So basically, how do you make this specific? And of course, basically, we have one thing in the world of Horizon that is quite unique. Uh, I'm sure that this have a large impact on all the cultures in the entire world. And that's, of course, the presence of giant robot dinosaurs. So we were thinking about how this could impact even the smallest things. Um, and I'll focus on clothing here, for example. Now, if you hunt, you have bone as a byproduct. And people in the real world have at times make bone armor and bone clothing. But it's not a really good idea. It tends to shatter when you hit it hard and then make you, you're stuck basically with tiny pieces of bone sticking into your body. So it's not a really good idea to try to build armor out of it. But of course, when you have carbon fiber and steel plates from robot machines, then those might be very well suited for armor. So we began experimenting with, with a way that it could be used in hunter's gear. So seeing how it could be mixed, so seeing how it can be woven into the clothing, being made part of the outfit, uh, we started looking at balances of making how much is necessary, how much is too little, because if you sort of take it all the way too far, it starts looking more like a science fiction game. If it's not present enough, basically, it doesn't really look too specific enough. And slowly, basically, we started defining a look for our characters and our tribes that was quite unique and fitting to the world. So through this technique of intrinsic ideation, we managed to create a wide variety of different cultures, uh, and each of these cultures is quite distinct from each other and fits in the environment of the world. Uh, and it certainly basically gave Horizon its unique visual identity. So the next trailer that I'm going to play, uh, yes, oh, it plays automatically, uh, is a year later after the first trailer that I showed you, all the way at the beginning. Uh, and now basically we're at a stage where we can show a little bit more about Your the cultures. Whole life you've been searching. And the elders, they've been holding you back. The girl is a curse. She came from nowhere. She is no one. When they told me to raise you, I didn't ask questions. Why am I an outcast? Who was my mother? Always you pushed for answers. Push yourself to the edge. are worse than not knowing. 
You can help? Or you can get out of my way. Then be ready for the darkness. And be careful what you bring to light. Even if you do catch what you're after, how do you know it won't bite back? Outcast! You came from nothing. You will die a nothing. I came from somewhere. Identity confirmed. Even if it destroys me. We'll see this through. So let's go back to the Robo Dinosaurs, because uh, that's why we're here. So this is our Robo Dinosaur pillar. Uh, hunts, all inspiring machines, Peggy, with your speed, agility, smarts, uh, and all these things. So this is basically where we started from, and we started looking, basically, what this means. Now, our experience, basically, designing machines is really Killzone. And in Killzone, we designed machines of war, military, industrial designs, uh, machines that were intended for war and destruction, and often they were alien and unnatural. They were basically monsters of war. Uh, and this was experience, so we started playing with a couple of ideas. Maybe the robots could be sort of half broken, so they're sort of like robots, monsters of war. Um, and also, maybe looking at strange ways of lo locomotion, uh, sort of making them almost like nightmare creatures. And uh, we were still using a version of intrinsic ideation by trying to emulate how a military design term, uh, firm maybe would approach this design challenge. Uh, we even role-played role that process a little bit by making the type of commercials that military contractors usually make. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen military advertisements on YouTube, for example. They usually have a sort of a hoorah sort of a vibe to it. So we tried to emulate that and maybe get a feel for these sort of things. When you invest in a GDLS vehicle, you know your investment is a sound one. And that investment extends well past the date your vehicle is delivered, because you have the assurance that through life support, one of the premier product support programs in the industry is behind you. A program you won't find anywhere else, because keeping you mission ready is what GDLS customer support is all about. And so we tried this, we built a couple of these machines and we put them in the game uh, and it really, really didn't work. Uh, the emotional core experience was completely off. Uh, and so we went back to the pillars and it told us that the core experience was really one about hunting. Uh, and with these machines you were fighting against them. Uh, it didn't make you feel like a hunter, it made you feel like a soldier in the world of Terminator, for example. And that wasn't what we were after. Also, one of the other pillars, uh, it's it clashed with, uh, it's asked for machines that had become a dominant life form. And these machines didn't come across as a life form, they came across as soulless machines. So we decided to scrap everything and co start completely from scratch. Uh, what we needed to design were machines that enabled the player to feel like a hunter. And it needed to feel alive and it needed to feel dominating. Uh, so what feels alive and dominating? Um, so we looked back at the last time, maybe there was another dominant life form on the planet. And so when somebody suggested in the company, like, let's turn them into dinosaurs, everybody sniggered and sort of realized, like, yeah, right. Uh, and then people started to take it seriously, and a lot of people got really, really worried. Uh, it's like, is, this, is the, this is the rule of cool problem, right? You add robot dinosaurs to a Viking game. So it's quite completely ridiculous. But reluctantly, we decided to just try it out. Maybe just see just where this goes. Uh, let's see what it's going to look and feel like. And then, as we started designing this and drawing concept sketches, something started to happen. And while the robot dinosaurs didn't really make any intellectual sense at all, it, the imagery worked emotionally. Maybe every time maybe one of these paints came out, people saw this and were like, this is what I want to play. So this, this idea of primitive mankind hunting these really high-tech megafauna just clicked with them, and it got everybody really excited, and everybody got inspired with game ideas and how this could work. So thinking about it, it of course perfectly encapsulates this feeling of being a hunter and having very dangerous prey. 
by using familiar shapes such as a T-Rex, everybody immediately understands their relationship to it. You're tiny, he's big, he's dangerous, you might be able to kill it. If you do a, a, a clever baby, you get a sense baby that you could hunt these things. And so while this created a lot of intellectual confusion, there was a lot of emotional clarity behind this concept, which in itself basically was an interesting juxtaposition. So maybe we should just play with it. Now, there were, of course, there were a lot of problems with this idea of robot animals. Um, maybe it was too strange, maybe it was too alienating for our audience to accept. And thankfully, of course, real life has some precedents here. Uh, these are the robots from uh, Boston Dynamics. Uh, they design animalistic machines because they are quite adept to landscape and walking in forests. Um, there's also, also this guy. This guy always kicks the robots. Every single movie that they make of these robots, there's this guy and he's kicking them. <laughs> so if the robot apocalypse actually happens, that guy, that guy. <laughs> Now this concept, um, this type of design is called biomimetic design. And it's an industrial design philosophy that looks at nature for certain engineering issues. And the notion behind this philosophy is that if you have millions of years of evolution, it has a tendency to result in pretty efficient designs. So a famous example of biomimetic design is the problem that the Japanese engineers had when they were working on the bullet trains. So every time maybe one of these bully trains and they travel at almost, I think, 300 kilometers an hour would go into a tunnel, it would create such an enormous air pressure wave that it would literally rip the train apart. And so if that happens, you can't really put people in trains. Um, so they were looking for a solution and they got inspired by the peak of a kingfisher, this, this bird that fishes and it dives from great height into the water and then catches fish. And of course, the less splash it makes, the deeper it can go, so there's a higher probability of survival. So thousands of years of evolution, so thousands of generations, hundreds of thousands of generations, have produced this, this beak that is perfect in hydrodynamics when you go basically at high speed into something. So they copied this design and put it on the front of a train and the train didn't blow up, so problem solved. <laughs> now, if you ever sit in airliners, basically you might remember those little bent tips now, maybe now at least you know where they come from. I still don't know what they do, but they come from birds of prey. Uh, I think maybe they have something to do with basically how they deal with turbulence in the air. And so we thought this was really interesting. Uh, when we designed our tribes, we spoke to anthropologists, so we figured it might be interesting to talk to people at the robot faculty at the Technical University of Delft and see what they think about future robot design. Maybe what, what is it all about? Um, and indeed, basically, they were using biomimetics, but they were also using something else. Uh, they were using these algorithms that mimics the process of evolution themselves. Uh, so they would create a design and then test it, and then they would crossbreed the design with other designs, like real evolution, and it would converge over thousands of generations into sort of strange-looking designs, but perfectly efficient designs. And strangely, they often look very organic. Uh, it's, it's not necessarily like art imitating life, it's art imitating technology that's imitating life. And so it seems more and more logical that very advanced robotics would converge to the shapes that we already see in nature. So for example, if you think about it, wheels didn't evolve in nature, but also there aren't any natural roads in nature. So it doesn't really make sense to have wheels in nature if you don't have roads. Uh, but in a world where you have mountains and lots of trees, it makes a lot of sense to have legs. Um, and then we also asked them if there were any flaws in nature. Maybe is there anything maybe that evolution didn't quite get right? Uh, are there any suboptimal solutions? And they said, yes, there's a very clear case of that. Uh, the, the skeleton is a really bad design. This is basically the evolutionary version of an IKEA closet. It's very cheap, but it's not built to last. If you imagine it, basically, if you're an animal in nature and you break your leg, that's pretty much game over. You're dead. Uh, and so it's also as this other thing, basically then you have the strong part on the inside and then you cover it with all this soft, mushy stuff like muscles. Basically, why would you put the vulnerable stuff on the outside? Wouldn't it make much more sense to put all the vulnerable stuff on the inside and put it in some sort of casing, uh, like a lobster? So there are these elements, basically, and nature in, did find a better solution, only basically we didn't turn into lobsters. Um, we started playing with a couple of these concepts, the concepts of biomimetics, uh, artificial climatic muscles, uh, algorithmically generated reinforcements, exoskeletons, and started uh, looking at an ex uh, exploring a look that would at least make the machines look believable. 
Um, but it's not just the efficiency of biomechanics that influence the shapes of living things. Uh, often creatures live in an ecosystem, in a niche of an ecosystem, and that drives certain evolution, evolutionary processes as well. It adopts certain shapes and behaviors because of it. And what we wanted to do is show a large variety of different machines, each with very clean, clear and distinct shapes, but also clear and distinct behaviors uh, that were coherent with their function within the ecosystem. So one of the first things we tried to design were the watchers in the games. And these are sort of like the guard dogs of our ecosystem. Uh, they are, as a function in the game, they're sort of like walking alarm bells. Uh, and first we thought, like, should we really be copying meerkats and dogs for this? Uh, maybe we can do something else and still sort of get the idea across. So one of the designers came up with this idea of a snake on legs. Uh, so it's a snake and it has two legs, so it can run really fast, but also because it's sort of, its body can slide between its legs, it can sort of be a snake that stands on the tip of its tail and then make a look out of a thing. And he said like, oh, this could look really interesting basically when we animate it. Uh, so we said like, okay, well, let's give that a try. And what I'm going to show you is basically the first attempt at creating a role in a game where we went like, hey, this might be something. So this is really old, 2011, I think, in the corner there. Wow, that's six years ago. Um, this is the first time, Becky, that we had an animated robot in the game and we got that sense right. So we showed this to a couple of people and maybe pretty much everyone basically was convinced basically that this was the way to go. Uh, they, d they felt alive, but also you could empathize with them. You could understand their behavior. You could even see how they communicated and that meant you could anticipate what they would be doing. And these four game designers are all brilliant things. Uh, and most importantly, it makes you feel like a hunter because if you can understand these things, you feel like you can understand your prey, which is really important for the feeling of feeling like a hunter instead of making somebody that just shoots at things. Uh, so that was a decision. Uh, we thankfully were able to rationalize our intellectual disbelief away. Uh, the cognitive dissonance had been resolved um, somewhat. And we felt like that we had now had a, a clear emotional clarity in our design. And we started thinking what more we could do with robot dinosaurs. Um, so it also basically meant that we needed to codify it, Becky. The part animalistic became part of the DNA of Horizon. Before, Becky, it wasn't really the case, and from this point on, it was. Um, I'm gonna go back to the trailer from 2015, uh, and I'm gonna show you a little bit about of the gameplay there, and there you can see how the sense of these machines, these living machines, and the sense of being a hunter worked.
The stories don't tell where the old ones went. They don't tell us why the machines rule these lands. But they warn us that this balance cannot last. The storm is coming. And I will be ready. So while arguably we could design any machine that we wanted, we still felt it would be better to stay with existing or extinct creatures. Uh, we felt that it had a, a way of sort of understanding the creature a little bit more for the player. They could anticipate the machine's behavior better. It's simply, basically, if it looks like a giant T-Rex, it's probably going to act like a giant T-Rex. Uh, so for example, we designed our version of the Terror Bird. I don't know if you guys know this thing. It lived about 10,000 years ago. It was a giant chicken that ate horses. Um, and so now that we had the visual style defined, it became quite easy to come up with a new look for these machines. Uh, and often, although it was clear how they should look, we didn't really know how they should move. Uh, so for example, how would something like a terror bird attack you? Now the obvious assumption is basically you see a giant beak, so it's probably going to peck you or bite you or something like that. But that's not necessarily the case. Um, and so we heard from paleontologists that often they st would study contemporary relatives of extinct animals to see how they would behave. In. And so Here's an image of roosters. These are sort of like the contemporary mini-me versions of terror birds, and they attack you like this. They're actually quite nasty as well. See how they wait for the girl to turn and then attack her from behind? So th this became a, a source of inspiration and comedy for our animators. Um, and so they started playing, making around with that. So the notion of a, a giant robot chicken baker that would karate chop you. And this is also then how it ultimately ended up in game. Now this process making ultimately a design was making a large variety of very interesting and very evocative creatures. Uh, we got a whole menagerie there of different sort of forms, making from extinct dinosaurs uh, to other extinct creatures, bisons, wolves, giant birds. Uh, and so the last thing I want to show you today before we go into the Q&A, Q we still have got about five minutes left, uh, is the, one of the last trailers that we made for the game, uh, which really was intended to sell the whole idea of what it feels like to be a hunter. Let me tell you what's out there. Vast reaches of wilderness. Untamed. A rugged domain. Majestic. But lethal. It belongs to them. The machines. Steel beasts who rule these lands and guard the secrets buried beneath its crumbling ruins. If you hunt these wilds, no matter how skilled you are, no matter how clever, you will become the hunted. Can you break that challenge? Can you pass that test? If you want to survive, you have to make the kill. Only then can you bring to light the deep secrets of the Earth.